For I am not ashamed of the gospel. Paul's flesh had every reason to be ashamed of the gospel because he preached a true one. We live in a day where we think that in order to be relevant to our culture, we must be like our culture. We live in a day where we think in order for the gospel to be relevant, we must somehow adapt it to the culture and nothing on the face of the earth or in the bowels of hell could be further from the truth. We are relevant not because we are like our culture, we are relevant because we are absolutely different. And our gospel has power not because it is acceptable to carnal men, our gospel has power because it is a scandal to men. Paul was not ashamed of this gospel, but his flesh had every reason to be. Imagine for a moment. We're not talking about a man who comes into the context of the Bible Belt. We're talking about a man who comes into the context of, of Jewish mythology. To Greek philosophy. Cons every concept of Greek philosophy. Every concept the Jews had about the Messiah contradicted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every time Paul the Apostle stood up, he seemed to carnal men to be nothing more than a raving madman. And every preacher that's ever been worth his salt since that day has had the same label put upon him. G. Campbell Morgan, when he would go up to the tower at Westminster to preach, he always said that he would quote the verse like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep before his shears. Why? He knew that unless God moved on his behalf with this gospel of God's dear Son, absolutely nothing would happen. But we don't see power like that today. Why? Because we prop up a gospel with the carnal devices of men. We remove the scandal in the name of love as though we had greater wisdom than God to tweak His gospel here and there so it might be more palatable to men. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the flesh has every reason to be ashamed of it. But in that lies the power. Everything about God's Messiah contradicted everything that men believed about the Messiah. Everything about God's salvation contradicts absolutely everything men believe about how salvation should be won and in what form it should take. And unless we realize that, we'll have no gospel here in this church. We'll have no power and we'll see no true conversion. We have to be willing to join our Master in being a scandal. That we preach Christ crucified in such a way as to exalt God Almighty and to humble men. So that in learning to despise themselves, They esteem the gospel and are saved. The worst thing that could ever happen to a preacher and the worst thing that could ever happen to a church is to become civilized and respectable. For in that lies no power. We are pilgrims. We are strangers. We are awkward. We are dislocated. We find no home here. No place where we properly fit because we have a city whose builder and maker is God. And our job is to take a gospel so covered up by the designs of men that it no longer has any power. It is our job to strip away all that faulty dress and to preach the bare bones of a gospel that's nothing more than a scandal. But in that, we will see the power of God. Now look at the gospel that we have today. Just let me set this gospel before you. The gospel of four laws. The gospel of five things God wants you to know. 
The gospel of how do you get to heaven, it goes something like this. Do you know you're a sinner? And then if the person says yes, then the next step, would you like to go to heaven? If they say yes, the next step, well then repeat this prayer. And if they repeat that prayer, then the next step. Well, did God save you? And usually the answer is something like this. I don't know. And then the witness for Christ says, Well, of course He saved you. If He didn't save you, He was a liar. Because He said, if you opened the door and invited Him in, He would come in. And He doesn't lie. And that right there is the reason why the great majority of evangelical organizations today are filled up with lost people. Right there. Now let's go through that scenario for a moment. Do you know you're a sinner? And sometimes we say it, you know, we, we want to not be too serious about all this. Now you know everybody's a sinner, don't you? My mother's been diagnosed with cancer. My mother-in-law has just recently been diagnosed with cancer. What would you think of a doctor who walked up to both of them and said, Now you know, you got cancer, don't you? The way we talk about sin betrays our ignorance of the absolute devastation of the thing. We talk to men about sin. What is wrong with being solemn? We live in such a trite age and we all march in a vanity fair where everyone wants to wear bright colors and ignore the fact that everyone's marching off a cliff into eternal destruction. Societies as we know them, the West is crumbling before us and we still choose to be trite and frivolous and happy. The fact of the matter is, man is twisted and broken and dead. The fact of the matter is, a judgment is coming. The fact of the matter is, all that we can see will be melted as with fire. And so we look to men and say, now you know you're a sinner, don't you? And usually we'll even say this, because we've been taught this in seminary. We say, well, you know we are all sinners. We don't want to just say you because we don't want you to feel isolated and guilty by yourself. I do want you to feel isolated and guilty by yourself. Because only in that will you come to see your need for Christ. You know you're a sinner, don't you? And if they say yes, we go on. Now let's go back. If someone says yes to the question, do you know you're a sinner? It means absolutely nothing. Go ask the devil! You know you're a sinner, don't you? You say, well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do, and, and I happen to be just about the best. The question is not, do you recognize you are a sinner? The question is this, since you have heard me preach the gospel, has God done such a work in your heart that the sin you once loved you now hate? And the righteousness you once hated and ignored you now desire? That's the question. Everyone knows they're a sinner. They just don't realize how heinous and terrible that is. Nor do they want to let go of the very thing that they choose to drink down as though it were water. So you see, the question is not, do you recognize you're a sinner? The question is, sir, as I have been speaking to you, or maybe it's long-term discipleship over a period of time, sir, as I've been sharing with you and discipling you, what has God done to your heart? People come to me all the time and they say, I have a new relationship with God. And I say, well, do you have a new relationship with sin? Because if you don't have a new relationship with sin, you don't have a new relationship with God.